And that would extend beyond the airwaves. I think the treatment is different in First Amendment law in general on that. Tom, did you have anything on that? I mean, there seems to be some confusion about the airwaves here, and I, I know, because I live in that confused world, but uh, it's been very, very good to me, so I don't complain about it. But the, the fact is that, that radio spectrum uh, ought to be regularized uh, as uh, any other valuable resource. We ought to uh, treat it as a, a valuable uh, commodity that, in fact, is an input into very productive services that are at the heart uh, of the information economy, and it should be treated as private property. And in the most uh, productive and beneficially used radio spectrum we have today, uh, we have gone the path of virtually every other country in the world to liberalize the ownership rights of radio spectrum for mobile carriers, mobile wireless carriers, and we treat spectrum that way. We can, in fact, do that generally to radio spectrum. We should continue to do that. We should end the extreme, I mean, the, the, the terrible thing about all of this is that the, 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 worst, the worst thing that this, this regulatory agency does, the FCC, is, is that it regulates and protects the killer application of 1952, broadcast television. In fact, we just got done subsidizing the continued use of that radio spectrum with a $2.2 .2 billion subsidy, this coupon for the set-top boxes for, for people who couldn't yeah. uh, get cable or satellite. So, uh, but that, that is enormously costly to protect the broadcasters in that spectrum uh, because all of that service could be provided by cable, satellite, and broadband uh, in a far more efficient way, and we could have much more speech uh, the way people want to have speech, which is internet-connected speech now with wireless broadband, but the, the, the vast inefficiencies uh, that, that we impose on society there are a reflection directly of the rules espoused by those new dealers who said it shouldn't be a private resource. But the, as I said, they didn't come up with that idea. The broadcasters actually came up with it first and it was just an adaptation. So the, it was an ex, ex post uh, uh, um, rationalization in fact. Uh, and, and it doesn't work. It, it's just, it's been, a, it's been a disaster in terms of public policy, both for free speech and economic efficiency. So yes, we should move on to much more. It doesn't mean we have to abolish the FCC, although I'd love to do that. It means that we turn the FCC into, an, in essence, a spectrum court that enforces property rights and does not engage in this arbitrary, uh, top-down, you know, Soviet-style management of spectrum on the one hand, and, and this uh, dictatorial determination of what the public interest is in terms of content on the other. And, and that includes, inde sorry, you can stop clapping, because that includes indecency rules. Okay, so I mean, if there's, if some obscenity can pass, <laughs> if some obscenity rules can pass for newspapers and it's a general regime that has nothing to do with radio spectrum, I suppose, then, then that's what we're going to have. And, and, uh, uh, and, and I won't even comment on it, but this, the idea that there should be some special rules for radio and television is, to me, anathema. Manny? Uh, well, admirable comments uh, by Tom, and uh, hopefully there's a lot of uh, consensus on abolishing the FCC if we could do it. Uh, I have a question. Uh, the topic here today is the Fairness Doctrine. The speakers have alluded to the fact that there's little vigor for doing, uh, resuscitating the Fairness Doctrine today, but there are other things in motion. And I'd like to ask the speakers if they would focus on the other things in motion, and particularly with an eye towards uh, a piece that was written uh, a couple of years ago by Mark Lloyd, who is the, uh, President Obama's uh, Chief Diversity Officer of the F FCC, who had a piece called Forget the Fairness Doctrine. And the essence of the piece is that the Fairness Doctrine was, is one way you can try to stifle, stifle uh, conservative or opposition uh, free market thought, but it isn't nearly as good as other things like localism and uh, 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 public interest diversity kinds of uh, uh, approaches, which really, if you read the article and hear other people in the, uh, in, in the uh, Obama administration, they're not particularly overjoyed about the idea of political dissent on, uh, on television. And my question is, what can you say if you would address Mark Lloyd's thesis? Do you agree with it, any of you? Or do you think that it's pretty contemptible stuff and really deserves uh, uh, special recognition here and being castigated at this meeting. Who wants to go first? Well, it's, it's either me or Tom. Well, 
Seaton, you've been remarkably quiet recently. Why don't you go ahead and go first? Well, uh, Mark Lloyd is a good point. Um, basically, after two attempts to legislatively resuscitate the Fairness Doctrine after it was rescinded in 87, it was vetoed by President Reagan and a threat of veto by George H.W. Bush, it led to the left looking for alternate routes to travel to arrive at the same destination, which is to shut down voices with whom they do not agree. They arrived at things like media diversity and localism. Um, they created Center for American Progress. They created a group called Free Press. Uh, Free Press was founded in 2002 by avowed Marxist Robert McChesney. Um, Free Press and Center for American Progress were the co-authors of the 2007 fraudulent report entitled The Structural Imbalance of Political Talk Radio, which excluded public radio and then said, gee, 91% of talk radio is conservative. Um, and their, their solutions to this alleged imbalance were rigid enforcement of their definition of media diversity and their de definition of localism, which would lead to these exact same sorts of censorship that you would get from the Fairness Doctrine. Um, Mark Lloyd, in particular, who was a senior fellow for the Center for American Progress at the time the report came out and the time he wrote the essay, which was a month later, um, actually came up with a diversity and localism mathematical equation, which was four numerators multiplied by one another over a denominator, and it was set up to fail. If you got a zero in any one of the four numerators, you got everything multiplied out, and you got a zero, and then you get fined by the FCC. He wrote in a book, a prologue to a farce, which should have been more aptly named a prelude to one, um, <laughs> that he wants to charge dollar for dollar the operating costs of a radio stations for their broadcast license. So they have to pay 100% of their operating costs for the privilege to broadcast before they ever flip a switch and, and broadcast anything. And then they have to meet his definitions of media diversity and localism and get fined like crazy for that. So yes, they've they've given up on the fairness doctrine. They've got other regulatory ways. And in that essay, and I have a quote here from that essay, he talks about talking to local activists to engage the FCC in broadcast license challenges uh, to, uh, based on ideological differences. And the sentence that he concludes with is local engagement, license challenges, nothing in there about the fairness doctrine. He's, he's moved away from it. The left has moved away from it. And the, the battlefield today is in large part over there in the, in the nebulous terms of media diversity and localism. Next. Um, but I, I've got to say I haven't read the, this particular report, so I can't comment directly on it. But let me, let me make a couple general points. Um, one is that, um, you know, I think Again, nobody's trying to revive the fairness doctrine. I would simply say that it was well-intentioned and of democratic origin and perfectly constitutional and consistent and enhancing of the First Amendment, and I would stick to that. But, but the, the main point is, as a policy, it's not an issue. The real issue is one of um, big media mergers um, and whether we're going to have you know, meaningful oversight over the, the concentration and consolidation uh, in the media market, whether we're going to you know, whether we will have meaningful antitrust enforcement, which again, I think is a uh, pro-democratic and pro-market uh, value, and whether we are going to continue to try to maintain a wall of separation between uh, corporate wealth, the, the wealth and corporate treasuries that's assembled um, through the corporate forum for business purposes, and electoral politics and public politics. Because if you have a, a breach of that wall, if you tear that wall down, at that point, we're fundamentally changing the character of democracy. So, um, you know, I, I'm persuaded that there's no reason to go back to fairness doctrine, and I like the idea of treating radio stations like newspapers if, in fact, anybody can get one. In fact, if there's equal access to, you know, to being able to get one of the licenses. At that point, it's very different from the way that it started with, you know, as Tom points out, uh, the urging of the National Association of Broadcasters to set up kind of a government regulated um, you know, broadcast spectrum that's closely regulated uh, by the government but enshrines kind of rent seeking behavior and, uh, and bonus profits um, in the stations. But I'm happy to move away uh, from all of that, but we do have to maintain a wall of separation between 
corporate power and the wealth that follows in its train and public elections and public politics.